All right, you know what time it is. MMA Hangout is in the building, and I'm always joined by the man himself, Danny Segura from MMA Junkie. Danny, what's up, brother? 291. Hey, the UFC doesn't miss. Dude, ever since uh, we kind of have like a rhythm going on here, and I've been hopping on as a guest, I'm not superstitious, but every card has been a banger. Just saying. 290, banger. 291, which we're going to get into at length was incredible i was at a bachelor party yeah. over the weekend and i went to key west and i told the guys in the bachelor party hey i don't care what happens on saturday night i'm finding a bar we're watching 291 i will not miss this for the world uh dustin gate dustin poirier justin gaethje uh alex Pereira versus jan blahovich two monster fights that we're going to get into right now what do you think of the card overall and again another thing that we look at and say the ufc hasn't missed in 2023 and it continues yet another pay-per-view card with monster numbers. Yeah, every pay-per-view pretty much this year has been a banger, and this was no exception. But th this was a bit of a cheat code because, like, going into it, we knew it was going to be good. How this good, maybe not, but we knew, like, guaranteed we we had some good fights in our hands. Just that main event alone was just stupid good. Um, I thought it, uh, it was actually going to be a war, like some fight of the night, fight of the year type thing. It wasn't, but it was still a pretty damn good fight and a great finish, obviously, with that head kick knockout. And overall, like if you just look at the card, something that I really love, and maybe this is kind of like the reporter journalist in me, but uh, storylines, man. Like wherever you look at it, Derek Lewis fighting out his contract, uh, debut for Pereira 205, like where, Tony Ferguson, is, is it his last fight? Is it the end of him? Like wherever you look at it, there's always like a storyline and we can literally probably do a video for each specific thing and just talk about it extensively. But uh, yeah, man, just a super deep card with uh, really fun results. Uh, and there was a ton of finishes. I think it was only like two decisions or something like that. Yeah, it was. I'm looking at the uh, at the card right now. KO, decision, TKO, submission, 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 decision, KO, submission, TKO, submission. <laughs> it's like it, it was a banger. Like we yeah. thought it was going to be that. And again, the UFC delivers on, on yet another pay-per-view. Let's start with the main event. Let's start with the BMF title, the vacant BMF title. Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, when this got uh, got announced earlier this year, I think every MMA fan was like, yes, we needed a rematch. These two guys are at the top peak of their powers right now. Justin Gaethje's on fire. Dustin Poirier on fire. And they met in the octagon and same building, same kick, same result. A new title holder. Again, one was for gold. Now this one was for silver, the BMF, by, the BMF title. Uh, what did you think of prior to the head kick? What did you think of that first round? Because it was high, high, high level mixed martial arts and boxing. Yeah, it was beautiful. I actually underestimated the evolution or I wouldn't really say evolution because I don't think he's changed drastically, but just the improvement of Justin Gagey throughout these five years. Cause the last time they fought was in 2018. I literally thought it was going to be a copy and paste fight from that year. Um, I think maybe there would have been some differences, but overall, I thought Dustin Poirier was going to win, and in a similar fashion um, than you know, like like the first one. But it, the big difference here is, I think Poirier came in improved, came in with the same style. Gagey came in improved as well, but on top of that, he came in measured. He came in a little bit more responsible, taking the right amount of risks before he was too reckless. Just a more matured, a more uh, poised, controlled fighter, and I think that was the key. Um, clearly, he picked his spots and um, didn't take unnecessary damage and eventually got the finish. But we're looking at a Justin Gagey that he's not really changing, not really reinventing the wheel at this point, but whatever little small details he can tighten up, that's what he's doing. He's just kind of perfecting or just making sure that the ship is a little bit you know, more tight. Um, and it's clearly making a difference because, you know, this time around, he was able to change the course of history, the result, and actually get a, a victory and get his hand raised. And the thing about Gaethje, too, is his MO as a fighter is he's going to put his face into the buzzsaw and try to spark you a couple times. He's going to get hit three or four times to his two times that he's going to hit you. And it, it did look more measured. It looked more of a chess match than what I thought was going to be just a phone booth fight where they're two just throwing absolute haymakers at each other the entire time. Gaethje looked measured. Gaethje was like, okay, I'm going to stand at a certain distance. I'm going to get you with some leg kicks. I'm going to give you some combinations here and there. And I thought there was elite level faint work 
from both yeah. guys. Like it, I would just watch them try and get something off across each other. And it was two chess masters playing. All right, you're going to move here. I'm going to move there. I'm going to show you this, but I'm going to take it back. And for, for Justin, that punch, same leg, head kick. I mean, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that was crazy because we're not really used to seeing that from Gagey. And something that, that I loved about his performance is that in older days, maybe he would have gotten clipped or, or, or hit and he just felt the urge to get one back and just bite down on the mouth, mouthpiece and even things out. This one, he would just wait for the right moment to, to sort of even things out. And it, yeah, it was just a great performance. Um, Poirier... Uh, clearly uh, a very skilled fighter. He actually did everything he could to block the kick. I mean, I don't know how much, what else he could have done to, to really stop that. He put his hand up and just the, the kick was so hard that it just wrapped around his hand and connected in like the ear and back of his head, which was legal, and uh, put him out. Uh, Gage is a beast, man. And if he can do that to Poirier, you bet your ass he can do that to Oliveira or Makashev. I would have him as an underdog if... You know, he does fight for the title next against either guy, whoever the winner is in October. But certainly uh, he's a live dog to becoming a champion, something I didn't think I would be saying post-UFC 291. Seriously, because yeah. those two guys, like Oliveira is fighting at an elite level. Makashev is a legend at this point. Like, <laughs> who's going to stop that guy? And we'll see that fight again, like you said, in 294. But if I were to tell you Justin Gaethje, Oliveira, Justin Gaethje, Makashev, you feel a lot more confident now than I think prior to 291. Um, I just see him with such a hard time with the wrestling and the jujitsu from both of those guys. Yeah, no, I, I think the tougher matchup, believe it or not, um, I think it's Oliveira. I think Oliveira's style suits perfectly for these kind of strikers. There's, you know, there's a reason why he's found so much success against Chandler, against Poria, against Gagey. But with Makashev, um, I feel like a lot of people just hadn't been able to solve him. And I think that Volkanovsky did everybody and in, uh, a huge favor. Uh, Volkanovsky had a ton of success. And if you have a competent coach and an elite level fighter, you can sit down, watch tape, take some of the things that work, add some of your own, plus add the size because uh, Gagey does have more power and is just a bigger force than Volkanovsky. And, and you know, Volkanovsky is a special talent. You might be able to watch and not be able to replicate what he does just because he's that good. But maybe there are some things that you can take away. And I think one of the big things are the leg kicks. Um, man, those leg kicks are brutal from uh, from uh, Justin Gagey. And, and, you know, Makashev is not Habib Nurmagomedov, right? Um, I actually see that fight pretty close. I would favor slightly Makashev, but I really do think that Gagey is, is all of a sudden a, a live dog in this title race. Lightweight division, best division in UFC? It's on fire right now. Oof, it is. It really is. Um, I would say second best. I would say yeah? second best. Yeah, I like 135 a lot. I think 135 is, is killers right now. Ridiculous. Um, but I would say this, uh, 155 does have bigger stars. So when it, when you see Poria face off against Gagey, there's like a, this tension in the air of like, you know, the two popular kids in school going at it, right? Like there's, there's something that bantamweights unfortunately can't replicate. But as far as like what's the deepest division, what's the most skilled division, dude, bantamweight is just even outside of the rankings, like the top 25 of bantamweight is just excellent fighters. Straight kills. Uh, so it, it's a tough one. It's straight killers in Bantamweight. We're going to see Bantamweight heavy 292 in Boston, which yep. is going to be exciting. O'Malley versus Aljo for the uh, for the belt. But I'm just looking across that lightweight division, man. I'm just like killer. Makashev, Oliveira, Dustin, Justin, uh, Chandler, Dariush. Like, it's just down, down the line. It's just killer mm -hmm. after killer after killer. And it's just it's such an exciting time for UFC. Like, if you're just getting into the sport, if, if this is – you getting into the on-ramp of this year of 2023 it's like getting into the golden age the 30th anniversary has like been the best year so far it feels like because nothing's missed big names big fights finishes submissions anything you can ask for in the storyline the ufc has it and i don't know what the secret sauce is but they've just been killing it and it's 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 a testament to dana to hunter to the entire team at the ufc because it's like this it shouldn't be going this good, it feels like. 
it's hard to hit home runs, man, every time. And they've been nailing it with their pay-per-views. Now, I will throw some criticism. Like, their, their finance have been weak, probably the, the weakest they've been in a while. So we do go through some lapses in this in this year where, like, the fights aren't that good. But pay-per-view-wise, when, when it comes down to putting money for quality MMA, you're getting your money's worth and more. Like, certainly, like, all these pay-per-views have just been – has just been – uh, absolutely ridiculous. And like what's ahead, like what's in store for the rest of the year looks pretty damn good as well. John Jones, Stipe, Makashev Oliveira too, uh, Shemaev, Paulo Costa, like O'Malley, uh, um, um, and Sterling, yeah. Sterling. Yeah. Like you just look at what's so far like scheduled and we got a pretty good lineup of pay-per-views. All right. Moving to the co-main event of the night, the light heavyweight uh, bout between Alex Pereira and Jan Blahovic. A close split decision. I saw that fight. I was like edge to Alex. I think he was very impressive getting out of a couple of clinches. I thought he was very impressive with his takedown defense. We know he's going to bring hands. Like, Bolatan, he's, he's going to bring hands. He's going to throw hands. Um, what did you think of Alex's move up to 205? He looked great physically, right? He, he doesn't have to cut an extra 30 pounds or whatever it is. What do you think of his uh, move up to 205? I was one of the biggest skeptics. Everyone was always saying like, yes, 205, like this is, you know, extremely uh, wise decision. This is great for, for his career. But I was actually a pretty big skeptic going, um, he never had any health issues uh, or at least public ones. He always made weight at 185. Um, he's one and one with the champion. He has a big size advantage and we know he doesn't really have the wrestling defense skills up to par because obviously he, the majority of his life has been, you know, devoted to kickboxing, not MMA. So that size advantage does help him in that department. And he's going to go up to 205 and lose all those advantages where as 185, yeah, the cut was hard, but again, he was always making championship weight and it, it didn't seem to affect his performance. And it seemed like his health was all right. So I was like, there's really no need for going up to 205, but um, man, he shut me up because at 205, he looked great. He looked bigger than Jan Blahovic. <laughs> and this is not like a guy that's, you know, stayed out for like a year and some change like John Jones did actually more, uh, before going up to heavyweight division to make sure he, you know, he bulked up and, and was up to par with those guys. Like he literally fought in Miami three months ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, he looked great at 205. He looked fast. He, the, his power translated, um, he fought what I think was the toughest test for him in that division because, of Jan's wrestling and strength. And he, he passed the test. I scored a 29, 28 for uh, Pereira. And if this would have been a championship fight, five rounds, I'm sure he would have had an even more dominant performance because it looked like one guy was coming up while the other guy was fading. Um, obviously in, in, in Pereira growing throughout the fight. So I thought he looked great, man. And I think he earned himself a title shot. It's crazy to think that a guy who's fought how many times in the UFC? A Bro, handful? this was his 10th professional fight. So, so two handfuls, okay? And he's already on the cusp of yet another title contender. In a like, different weight class. In a different weight class in 10 fights. Yeah. Like, it's insane what he's what he's been able to do. And I think we both agree, everyone would agree, that light heavyweight, once very, very proud, probably the most elite division in mixed martial arts, is now uh, just trying to find his footing. And when you look at Yuri, when you look at Jan... When now you look at Alex Pereira, it seems that he's the guy that's going to usher light heavyweight into the future, even though he is a little bit more advanced in age. Like there's just nobody else who's really a contender that can stand in there with him, trade blows. And if he continues to get his takedown defense and his his groundwork online, who's going to stop that guy? Yeah, dude, that that's like one of the biggest things. And I'm so glad that you mentioned it because. I feel like a lot of people were kind of down on that performance. Like, oh, it was really close. And yeah, he has, he, he's got some deficiencies. But like, dude, that was his 10th professional fight. That was Jan Blachowicz's 40th <laughs> professional fight. Okay. Like there's a huge gap in, in, in experience. This guy literally all throughout his life until his early 30s uh, did kickboxing. And now he just decided to pick up MMA because again, the whole Adesanya thing. And it seems that there's bigger paydays in MMA compared to kickboxing. And the guy's actually gone pretty good. Like, I wouldn't say, like, he's super well-rounded. But certainly, he looks like a guy that has more than 10 fights in under his belt. And is just super, super impressive. And I wonder if he would have started MMA in his early 20s, you know, a, a decade ago. 
um, what kind of version we would we would be seeing right now. I think that's that's uh, is just super impressive, and and what he's doing with his career is is tremendous. Um, and yeah, I think he's a perfect ingredient for 205, a division that's currently lacking a lot of name value, a lot of talent. And uh, Pereira is just, you know, a spark plug right there. You know, he just kind of, um, you know, a shot of adrenaline to that division. And it looks like the UFC is going to go towards the direction of uh, Poatan versus Prochaska, which I think is a stupid huge, good fight. Huge oh, my fight. God. A huge, huge fight. fight. And it's just like. Yeah, I mean, I, you just got to play the, their highlight reel and that's it. That's that's all you got to do. No narration, no spell, no special. No effect. Ron Perlman, like, hey, just it. go. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. And it'll sell itself. That's a fight. The The incredible thing about Alex, too, is obviously he's got a great corner. Glover's there, champion of the division, legend of the sport, helping him kind of acclimate to mixed martial arts and what – those guys, the, the top tier of that division does, especially on the ground and wrestling and stuff. And to see him get out of clinches, to see him get out of really sticky situations was in, very impressive to me. I think when you have that close of a decision, to me, it looks at, I look at, all right, for a guy who doesn't have a great ground game, how did he fare against the guy who does have a good ground game? And I think to me that the judges were looking at that saying he he got out of a lot of sticky situations and did what he had to do uh, in his plus areas more so than Jan. But when you talk about Yuri versus Alex, and especially with Jamal Hill now out of the picture for a year, maybe yeah. more, like depending on that Achilles injury, which is massive for fighters because that's all of your powers from your legs. And if your legs compromise, that's not good. Like we could be looking at a guy hold two belts in a matter of a year and a half in two yeah. different weight classes yeah i mean he he could have very well retired from the sport as a two division ufc champion while also being a two division glory kickboxing world champion Insane. uh dude the guy is ridiculous he, he he's a phenomenal talent stone-faced um, not smiling yeah. Yeah. ever 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 those pictures are hilarious and just a, a really fun personality i, I really think the ufc struck gold with him uh by bringing him on uh sometimes you see the ufc like bringing these like random kickboxers and i remember a long time ago like when conor mcgregor was like blowing up blowing up in the ufc um they brought in the only person that had defeated him at the time joseph duffy didn't turn out to be like a big thing but with this with this one i mean the whole rivalry with adesanya that's still pending by the way oh one my god one. yes i do think they fight in the future at 205 um, you know what I think Adesanya is doing? And, and this dude is so good at manifesting stuff. Um, he's hoping that Poatan wins the title. And he goes, okay, you've been Michael myers me like all this ty entire time. And I following got you me. now. I'm going to follow your ass now. <laughs> we'll go five and take your shit. Um, I think that's what's going to happen. And uh, it's very likely, dude. Like, I do think he becomes champion, Poatan, at 205. It's, it's such, a, such an exciting time to follow uh, MMA. For those of you just tuning in for this post game show, we're going to do more on the back end. We still have a couple, three more fights to talk about. Check out the MMA Hangout. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. Reviews that'll be on YouTube. The rest of this uh, conversation with me and Danny Segura. Danny, for the people in the post game, let them know where they can get your stuff, and then we'll just flip over and talk about the rest of the rest yeah, of the fight. Follow me on uh, all social media platforms if uh, if you'd like. Uh, that's uh, at Danny Segura TV, and you can follow my work in English on MMAJunkie.com, as well as my work in Spanish uh, at uh, Hablemos MMA on YouTube, as well as all other social media. All right, let's do it. Next fight, Derek Lewis, the Black Beast, in his last fight in the UFC, at least contract-wise, yeah. right now, against Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Uh, this one, <laughs> I, I will be honest. I did place a wager. I had a parlay going, and I did pick de Lima. Because okay. I've seen I've yeah. seen the movie too many times. Derek Lewis comes done. out. We thought Black Beast was done. <laughs> we thought Black Beast was done. He comes out. He gets hit with something. He falls. Game over. I'd seen it a million times. But what I didn't see coming was that flying knee. I don't think Marcos did either. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously. Nope. I don't think anybody did. Yeah. You yeah, must have let been us tripping at that bachelor party. <laughs> like <laughs> I was watching. I was like, oh, my God. I can't believe what I'm watching yeah. right now. Yeah. What did you think of... Uh, First, let's put that fight into into perspective. And if this is the last time we see Derek Lewis in the UFC, 
uh, put his career into perspective for people? I mean, MMA is like such a crazy sport where like fortune can change like so rapidly and the vibe can change so rapidly too. going into it. And I don't blame you for putting money on, on the Lima going into it. Derek Lewis was one and four in his last five fights and for those four losses, he was stopped. So, you know, a guy that's taking a good amount of damage stopped four out of his Last five fights, he, I believe, is like 38 or 39, has had his title shots in the past. Like, yeah, it just did seem that um, he was just, it's just the natural course of, you know, father time and that he was going to sort of fade out of this division. But Rogério Lima came with an opposite record, four and one in his past five fights, was looking good. And it just kind of seemed like, again, bringing up a fighter while using the name value that Derek Lewis still possesses. And they literally, literally, in in 33 seconds, <laughs> he picks up a knockout, breaks the record for the most knockouts in UFC history. So he's the leader on that. Um, takes off his pants and does the whole thing or his shorts. Um, goes viral and then reveals that he fought out his UFC contract. And all of a sudden, he's probably the hottest free agent right now in mixed martial arts, considering that Francis Ngannou is in need of a dance partner in MMA for next year when he returns to the PFL in 2024. And what a better fight than Derek Lewis. The two had fought previously and literally the most boring fight in UFC history. More boring than Carlos Parza versus Rose Namajunas recently. That was um, tough. They entered, Lewis entered with an injured back and Ngannou had a mental issue coming off a uh, loss to Stipe Miocic, his first professional loss. So we kind of felt robbed. Like there's no way if they ever fight again that it'll be, that that'll happen. Like literally it, it, the, the, the hardest hitting guy in the, in, in MMA in Ganu and the most successful knockout artist in UFC heavyweight history. Uh, I mean, that fight we never saw it in the UFC. We uh, they didn't fight that night, and <laughs> it looks like, or at least there's a possibility that we could see it uh, under PFL. So literally, from going almost finishing his career, he's done uh, one and four in his last five, five fights to becoming the hottest free agent, potentially getting a huge fight against Francis in Ganu. If not a fat contract from the UFC. So he doesn't go and fight Francis Ngannou. I mean, MMA is just wild, dude. It's just the craziest sport in the world. 33 seconds was, yep. the, was the balance beam between fading into darkness and becoming <laughs> the hottest ticket in, in mixed martial arts. And you know for a fact that Dana does not want anybody of note going over to PFL to fight against Francis Ngannou. He wants to choke that out at the root. He wants absolutely nobody going to fight francis and now derrick lewis is in such a position to be like perfect you don't want me to fight against francis for a seven figure payday you know what time it is pay yeah. the man dude derrick lewis is gonna get paid whether he stays in the ufc or goes to pfl like that man that man just made it with those 33 seconds and yeah it's insane and literally that's little the most derrick lewis thing ever like going in there flying knee knockout this guy um, taking off his pants, going viral, and then, you know, just saying, oh, by the way, I just finished my contract with the UFC. It's just crazy. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's nobody like Derek Lewis. I mean, long live the, the Black Beast. I hope he sticks around for some time because certainly the sport is is a lot more fun with him, uh, with him around for sure. Absolutely. Let's move on to Lightweight. And one of the more interesting fights of the night, Bobby Green versus Tony Ferguson. This one was tough because Tony looked really good in the first round. I thought he was moving good. I thought that he was not confusing Bobby Green, but he was putting Bobby Green in positions where he he wasn't able to box the way that he wanted to. And then the eye poke. And I think the trajectory of the fight completely changed after that eye poke. Tony's a warrior. Tony, his, his leg could be flying off and he'll still fight. Like he's just that guy. Um, what did you think of... First off, the arm triangle choke from Bobby from Bobby Green, which nobody saw that coming. Dude, What's I think that was at a plus like four thousand or five thousand. It, it was insane. It was yeah. insane. Like, he, I think he's only had one other submission in his career, mm -hmm. and he ends mm -hmm. up submitting Tony. And even in that submission, Tony was kicking his legs. You you could see that he couldn't breathe, and he still wasn't tapping out. Yeah. It was it was such a Tony Ferguson performance. But uh, Tony, man, what? I think I saw a stat where he was 12-0 and 0 from 16, maybe earlier, 
from like 15 to 19 and then from 2013 20... to 2019 okay six 20 years six years he was 12 and 0 yeah and then the last three he's what one and four no dude uh oh and six oh and six okay i was i was yeah. reading it wrong yeah, 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 yeah the fall of tony ferguson he looked <laughs> really good man but then that eye poke changed everything you know i would have to disagree a bit there like i do think the the eye poke may or may not have had a uh, had its its impact there but an elite fighter would overcome that like we've seen so many fighters get you know fouled kicked and growing whatever and then overcome that this was um a time where again he gets submitted by a guy that's a striker he loses against a guy who's not even in the ufc rankings it's pretty evident that Tony Ferguson no longer is the man that he used to be. I think we've known this for some time, but he keeps going out there and saying, no, I'm going to come back. I'm going to win a title. And, and he just keeps saying it to a point that you go, is there something to this? But each time we just get further and further and further from, you know, actually believing him. And at this point, I think it was the nail in the coffin. Like Tony Ferguson, I hate to say it because, I, you know, he was one of my favorite fighters at some point. Um, and I have tremendous respect for Tony Ferguson. And I do keep in mind that we're talking about somebody's career, somebody's lively, livelihood here, somebody's dream. So it's easy to, for us to, like, sit here and, and kind of criticize it. Um, but, man, he's done. He's done. I mean, I, I don't see how the UFC keeps him around after six consecutive defeats where he's been finished in his last three fights. And he's almost 40 years old at lightweight. Um I think his time is up and I really do hope that he retires because it's just going to get worse and worse and worse from here. He said five fights and a title. Yeah. That's what he was saying. Uh, pre-fight. <laughs> like it, it, look when you're a warrior and you're just bred in that life of, I have to survive. I got to do whatever, even if I have to fight other men for my money, it's hard to change that mindset and be like, you know what? Yeah, yeah I am done. I'm cooked. I, I don't have it. In, I don't have it anymore. Right. We saw Masvidal do it in Miami. He said, look, I've fought a million times. I'm good. I have the money. Like I'm, I'm going to retire now. It seems like a probably Tony doesn't have that money. First and foremost, B he's just looking at a, at a mirror and saying, look, I can still do it because he has that warrior mindset. But the mirror is looking back and saying, Bobby, you don't have it anymore. Like, it's yep. over. It's over. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's sad, man. Because like, if you hear Masvidal, like after that fight against uh, Burns in in Miami, he was pretty honest. He was like, I, "Could I still hang with like the top twenty guys? Yeah, but like, I'm not in that business, and and I'm slowing down. I'm I, I no longer have the same reflexes, the same power, uh, the same speed. Like, I'm I'm you know, and it's and it's normal. We saw Robbie Lawler recently retired, and he was saying the same thing. And that doesn't mean that they didn't enter with confidence thinking they could win their bouts. Um, you know, I mean, Robbie Lawler destroyed his opponent in the first round. But um, there, part of me feels a relief when there is that degree of reality, of, mm. of perception, of, of self-awareness. Because you go, okay, like, this guy, Sion de Stapparao, you know, like, mm -hmm. he knows where he's standing. With Ferguson, it, it's just so detached from what's actually happening like the fact that he thinks that he can actually go on another title run at 40 years old on a six fight losing streak it's like it's, in that division in that division too <laughs> is, it's just bad man so um i hope that he's financially stable and i hope that he's in a position where he can retire and be comfortable um i'm not sure that he is uh, i would assume this is the last of him in the ufc and you bet your ass that other promotions are are going to be, you know, really antsy to, to acquire his services just because he's a big name. And I don't know. I would hate to see him lose to, you know, somebody you've never heard of, Papito from La Esquina, you know, right. just for... And it just but. fade off into the distance like we thought Derek Lewis was going to do. Yeah. It's it's a cruel sport, man. It, it MMA is. is a cruel sport. It'll let you know how old you are very quickly. Yeah. And if you have it or not. Um, Speaking of if you have it or not, Kevin Holland versus Michael Chiesa. Whew. Kevin looked good. Darce choke came from nowhere. Did not see that one coming. Uh, another submission I didn't see coming. Kevin looked good. Looked like he took everything his camp serious, this fight serious. We know that he can kind of be uh, be drifting mentally mm -hmm. uh, against his opponents and stuff. Michael Case off of what two years that he hasn't fought? Yeah, I think it was like May 2021 or something like that. So we're looking at almost two years and some change for Michael Case. Uh, his back. 
it, he just looked like a shell of himself. And Kevin pieced him up real quick, took him down, Darsh choke, and it was over. Uh, what did you think of Kevin's performance? And again, looking back at another guy who a good career, good fighter, but father time knocks on that door and it's over. Yeah. Um, I, I liked Kevin Holland's performance a lot. I think this is kind of what I was hoping to see because Kevin Holland has always been a good fighter, but he's always been a fighter that you're not really sure how seriously he takes his career. He's retired before and be like, I'm done. And then comes back. And again, he's just 30 years old. He was born in 92. Um, and, um, and yeah, like he's just been a guy that you, he just, you just feel like he underperforms. He's out there in the fights, like talking smack, getting controlled and talking to his opponents and being silly. And you're like, dude, you could be so much more, right? If right. you actually like kind of t took this just a bit more seriously. Um, and this was it. This was exactly that. He fought poised. He was controlled. Um, he striked when he needed to strike. He took advantage of er every single moment that he, he possibly could. And uh, he just looked like a more mature version of himself. And I think that's the difference between a guy that's just going to be fun and to like fill in a, in a pay-per-view, maybe headline a fight night card here and there to a serious title contender. And, and I don't think it's far-fetched. I don't think it's crazy to think that Kevin Holland in the next two or three years could find himself fighting for the title at 170. He's tall. He's rangy. He's got nice pop, good striking, good submissions, improved wrestling um tough as shit I, the guy's pretty well-rounded and uh, he kind of his persona kind of fools people into not taking him seriously but the guy's a serious threat at 170 and i hope he stays there because he mentioned about possibly going up to 185 um Yeesh. which is like bro like I, that one i don't think you want to see yeah. those guys but again you don't you never know what to like believe from him because he also said in that same quote Oh, I might drop to 155 too. And if you've seen him in person, there's no way in hell he can make one. He doesn't have no game on. Like, no, he, he's, at, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's at 170. That's, that's, that's all he's yeah. got. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see. But he, he looked great, man. And uh, something also that I love, and this is outside of fighting about uh, Holland, is that he's brutally honest, like brutally honest. That dude has no filter, um, for better or worse. Some people don't like that. Uh, I can appreciate it. And I, I thought his comments on Kiesa were on the money. He's like, that guy's a, a really good commentator. He's actually one of the best commentators analysts in ESPN. And like, I'm a bad dude, but there are people that could probably do worse things to him. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like he's having a successful career with ESPN as a commentator. He's probably making good money. Like, why continue rolling the dice and, and, and playing with your health, right? Like, you step in there. Uh, one way and you don't have any guarantee you're going to be the same man stepping out that's just the nature of fighting so um it's harsh right because kiesa um you can tell he the hunger's there you know fighting through all these back problems just to get back to this position but if, if you look at it objectively is like you know is the juice worth the squeeze at this point like is he gonna fight for the title is he gonna be champion he's 35 i don't think so um and if he could make money doing something that doesn't compromise his health then you know maybe maybe he he should consider that it's it's just such a tough sport man we're again we we talk about it with tony we talk about it with Derek lewis with jan blahovich going back in with yuri coming off of a of another injury of shoulder that's kept him out for 10 months like yeah this sport is no joke and the moment you step in and they lock that octagon door it only takes one hit it only takes one drop it only takes one kick and your life is completely changed forever. So it's like you need to go in there with a plan, right? Because yeah. e and and even if you go in with a plan, you still may come out uh, for worse on the other side of that of that bell. And if you have a backup plan and you're a Chiesa, like you you need to take it because right yeah. now it's it's looking like it's over. That's the thing. Like, look at Ferguson. It doesn't seem like he has a backup plan, right? Like, right. all these fighters, a lot of them are forced to fight because they don't have an alternative to making money or at least a lot of money. Kiesa does. Right. He's currently doing it. So it's like he's he's got uh, another route to go to. And I feel like if you do, that's a privilege in the sport. You know, there's – I mean, you know this. In the media landscape, there is a, a, a very fight night. Uh, amount of jobs and those jobs you know don't really rotate that often and uh if you have one of those jobs like you best hold on to it because you know it's it's hard to come by and uh, again there's only certain amount of former fighters that can be analysts for espn for the ufc michael kiesa is one of them um 
Again, I'm not going to tell him to retire. That's that's entirely on him. But uh, certainly it, it would make sense if he does, right? It does. It does. And especially when you got that backup plan and, and you're one of those guys that can go yeah. out and do what he does. Like, it, it only makes all the sense in the world. 291 was insane. Uh, what else is there to say, man? Like, UFC's on fire. 292 in Boston, August 19th, which is going to be another just another banger. Like, everything is just bangers. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you're a fan of the sport, you have been treated so well this year. If you're not a fan of the sport and you're trying to find your footing into what this is, this has been an incredible year to just absorb amazing fighters, amazing fights, amazing storylines. And the year's not done. We got another five months left and five pay per views that are just going to be off the chain. So I, that's all I can say. It's just, yeah. uh, July was July was incredible. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, and we'll be here to to talk about it. And I appreciate the invite. Um, but yeah, man, this sport is just blowing up. I mean, I've been covering it for a while now, and and this is a very special year. So if you're just listening to this and you haven't tuned into the previous cars, and you're like, oh, these guys are just you know hyping it up, yeah, hyping no. it up. I'm telling you, like, <laughs> we're not. This is a special year. So you best tune in because um, this is a, a boom and bust sport. Like you know. These these years come by and they're great, but then there's some other years that might be a little thin, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, take advantage. Danny, let the people know where they can get you. These are the hardcores that stuck around for the Derek Lewis, the Bobby Greens, the Kevin Hollins, the people that you know are really into this. They're probably already following you, but if they want to get more of your content, where can they find it? These are my people. These are my yeah. people. So, uh, La gente yeah, buena. No, you, yeah, if you stuck around, I mean, props to you. Congrats. Um, yeah, this card was awesome. And, uh, and yeah, you can find my work. I work for MMA junkie, uh, MMA junkie.com. You can find my work in English there. I do Spanish language content as well on the best. MMA on YouTube. Thank the you, best man. Spanish content. There's no, uh, so there's so, nobody yep. else doing it. Like this is it right here. If you want to listen to it, Spanish and then social media at Danny Segura TV, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok perhaps coming soon oh. we'll, we'll, we'll see i gotta i gotta loosen up you know get, get my <laughs> dance moves going there we go danny appreciate you brother as always this is the mma hangout and we'll be back to preview uh 292 together how about that yep all right sounds good perfect peace